Chapter Five, Part Two of Commentary on the Gospel of John, Book Four, by Cyril of Alexandria, translated by Reverend Philip Edward Pusey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Nine ten, when he had said these words unto them, he abode in Galilee. But when his brethren were gone up, then went he also up unto the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. Christ dwells gladly in Galilee, and banished from the country of Judea, takes up his abode more peaceably and securely, that again the multitude of the Gentiles, albeit exceedingly uninstructed, by reason of the error that yet holdeth them, might be shown to be nobler than those who seem to be skilled in the law. By this he showed both his just love for them, and most reasonable hatred of them of Judea. For how would not he who knoweth all things before they be, be so affected, as to deem the church of the Gentiles already worthy of the divine love, since it was so easily called to believe on him, and at length to cast off and justly loathe Jerusalem as senseless? He who even before the times of his coming is said to have desired her beauty, according to the voice of the psalmist but called the stiff-necked Jerusalem and harlot and an adulteress, and of the like of this what did he not call her? Most clearly in truth doth he by the prophet Ezekiel say to her, Wherefore, O harlot, hear the word of the Lord, and by the voice of Jeremiah accuseth her as an adulteress, calling out, As a wife rejecteth her husband, so the house of Israel rejected me, saith the lord as having then according to the foreknowledge of god befitting counsel surveyed the beauty of the church of the gentiles and the baseness of the synagogue of the jews in its wicked ways he already before loveth the one and goeth in unto her as to a bride in the chamber but for hateth the other reserving for the fit time what was due in full measure to each for he neither brings wholly upon them of Israel punishment before the time, nor gives himself wholly to Galilee before the saving cross. For then he could with justice and on reasonable causes withdraw from his love to them. Having then said that he would not go up to this feast, and having permitted his brethren to do so, if they would, by himself, for he affirmed that his time was not yet come, does he go up after them, not saying one thing and doing the contrary to what he says? For that would be lying, albeit guile, that is, falsehood is said not to have been found at all in his mouth, but minded to what he promised. For he goeth not up to the feast with them, but rather to admonish them. And since he came to save, to say and teach the things which lead to life everlasting, for that this was his aim, his not wishing to go with them that were going up, and going up hardly and secretly, not openly, and with the joy of those who go to a festival, will clearly show. And verily, when at length he was going up to his saving passion, he went up not in secret, but borne upon an ass's colt, as a type of the new people, with an almost innumerable company of children preceding him, fulfilling the part of the people that should be born of whom it is written and a people which is created shall praise the lord and the children going before were shouting blessed is he that cometh in the name of the lord hosanna in the highest therefore by coming up in secret he shows that christ came to jerusalem by no means to feast with them but rather to dispute against them for as we have before said, he doth not wholly depart from Israel till on being delivered up to death. It is clear that he deservedly did so. But as to his saying that he would not go up, and afterwards not refusing to go up, you will find the type of it fulfilled long ago in the book called Exodus. For the divine and most holy Moses was making long stay in the mount with God, awaiting the law that was to be given by him. And Israel, disregardful of piety towards God, was making a calf in the wilderness. 
but the lawgiver is justly angered at these things and having cried out against the lightness of those who so readily turned aside to what they ought not and having threatened to utterly destroy them at once at last he says to the holy moses depart and go up hence thou and thy people which thou broughtest forth out of egypt unto the land which i swear to abraham isaac and jacob saying unto your seed will i give it and i will send an angel before thee then moses says to him if thyself go not with me bring me not up hence and how shall it be truly known that i have found grace in thy sight i and thy people is it not in that thou goest with us and the lord said unto moses i will do this thing also that thou hast spoken for thou foundest grace in my sight seest thou how he grieved at the apostasy of israel affirmed that he would not go up with them into the land of promise but said that he would send an angel yet out of respect to moses and the remembrance of their fathers he granted them pardon and promised again to go with them having then said that he would not feast with the jews as being haughty and violent as dishonouring god by their denial of him as these did by making the calf yet being very slow to anger towards the offences of those who grieve him and rather fulfilling his promise to the holy fathers he goes up to teach and to set before them the doctrines of salvation not committing such a ministry to an angel just as he did not then but rather being himself the worker even for the salvation of the unthankful eleven the jews therefore were seeking him at the feast and said where is that man the jews seek jesus not that they may believe on him when they have found him for surely would he preventing their search have offered himself according as it is said of him i was found of them that sought me not i was made manifest unto them that asked not after me but of their exceeding transgression falling into the vain toil of the greeks and emulous of their habits rather than of those things whereby it was like that they should be enlightened by the grace from above for those of the greeks who seem to be wise filled with worldly and devilish wisdom expend long and subtle discourses and revolve cycles of vain propositions and weaving the spider's web as it is written make faint to investigate what is the nature of truth or goodness or justice and moulding to themselves a shadow only of the true knowledge abide wholly untasting of the virtue that is in deeds and remaining destitute of the true wisdom which is from above make their exercises about words alone to no profit the jews again brothers and neighbours of their unlearning seek for jesus not that they may believe on him when they have found him as the nature of things proved but that they hitting him with their many revilings might bring the fire unquenchable upon their own heads and in another respect we shall suppose that they made most idle search for they only pretend to seek him because he is not present for says one the wonder-worker ought to be present with the feasters seeking rather pleasure in the enjoyment of it and not at all the profit from the marvel but wrapped round in conceit of knowledge of the law and thinking that they were to no slight degree instructed in the sacred writings they are unmindful of the prophet's voice thus speaking seek ye god and in finding him call upon him when he shall draw nigh you let the wicked man forsake his way and the unrighteous man his counsel and let him return unto the lord and he will have mercy seest thou how it will not suffice unto salvation to seek only but when we have found to turn also that is to say by obedience and faith so might the foolish and refractory people of the jews have been saved but since in this too they are found exceedingly unwise they will at length with reason hear how do ye say we are wise and the law of the lord is with us 
in vain to the scribes was their lying pen the wise men were ashamed dismayed taken what wisdom is in them because they reject the word of the lord for how did they not reject it who received it not how did they not despise it who in boorish wise refused not to say of it where is that man for the expression that man belongs to the abandoned and them who no longer deem fit to wonder at him although from his so marvellous working they ought to have had the most exalted conception of him twelve and there was much murmuring of the people concerning him some said he is good others said nay but he deceiveth the people ever hard of attainment and difficult of acquirement is goodness and the power of tracking the beauty of truth is hard of accomplishment to the many especially the more unlearned and those who have no acuteness of understanding who from most foolish swayings of thoughts without understanding turn aside to what seems to them easier and not enduring to prove the nature of whatever offers itself will never attain to the true quality of things albeit paul says be ye approved bankers and persuades us to prove all things so as by accurate investigation to arrive at the attainment of what is profitable let them hear then who of their exceeding folly marvel not at jesus but think that it is fit to condemn him without inquiry taste and see that the lord is good for as they who prove choice honey by the taste and from the merest taste perceive what they are in search of so they who make even a little trial of the words of the saviour will acknowledge that he is good and will marvel in learning it the wiser then among the jews plead christ's cause and give right judgment concerning him consenting to him as good considering as is like this above all that it would not be possible for one to accomplish the things which god evidently works unless he were by nature god or partaker of god and therefore good to whom would be fit the approval of all and to be in strengthened with grace from above even though this were not so in christ for christ is himself the lord of powers but they wade in most absurd imaginations and go astray far from the truth who shrink not from calling him a deceiver who directs unto the unerring path of righteousness let the foolish jew then hear woe unto them that call evil good and good evil that put darkness for light and light for darkness for along with approving wickedness ranks the finding fault with good and keeping back from evil its most deserved reproof in casting upon them that are ranged on the side of good the blame which is in no wise due unto them but the charges against them for these their revilings were foretold also for woe he says unto them for they swerved from me wretched are they because they transgressed against me i redeemed them they spake lies against me thirteen howbeit no man was speaking openly of him for fear of the jews there was murmuring among the jews and for fear of the jews he says that no man could speak openly the divine evangelist then is calling the rulers of the jews emphatically jews not deigning as seems to me to call them elders or priests or the like kindled with pious jealousy and to grief to them word whom with reason does god accuse of destroying his spiritual vineyard saying in the prophets many pastors destroy my vineyard they defiled my portion they gave my longed-for portion for an impassable wilderness it hath become a vanishing of perdition for how shall we not suppose that the lord's vineyard hath in truth been destroyed by their abominations when they showed that even to agree with the good and only to marvel at that which is worthy of marvel is hazardous 
but that this too works a sorer punishment for the rulers of the jews and the rest of them what wise man will doubt lo for lo the whole people fear and tremble before them yet are not instructed in the law nor yet taught to live in a fitting manner although very zealously subjected to their injunctions for fear is a proof of the very highest subjection they were compelled then to transgress rather than wisely to look unto the purpose of the lawgiver and in that they dare not so much as praise what is good to give by no means a voluntary but a constrained judgment of evil against whosoever the others choose and to condemn as base him that is worthy of praise and admiration just as a man therefore who has good skill in seafaring matters and sits at the ship's helm and having her at his command dashes her against the rocks would be himself held guilty of the wreck or as if one accustomed to drive were borne along by the swiftest ponies and being able by the checks of the reins to hold their easily directed flight whithersoever he would were to dash the wheels against a stone not to the ponies would he reasonably attach the blame of the misfortune but rather to himself in like manner i deem the rulers of the jews having the people of the jews not only honouring them but even serving them by fear as well if they manage them contrary to the divine commands shall justly themselves incur responsibility for the loss of all but that themselves were the cause of the perdition of the people the prophet jeremiah will testify saying for the pastors became brutish and sought not out the lord therefore the whole flock understood not and were scattered fourteen when it was now mid-feast jesus went up into the temple and began teaching temple befitting is the teaching of our saviour for where else should we rather hear the divine voice save in the places where the divinity is believed to dwell for god tendeth all things and will not be conceived of as circumscribed by space in respect of his own nature but is wholly uncontained by things that are yet is it more meet that we should suppose that he dwells in the holy places and we most reasonably deem that the will of the divine nature will specially be heard by us in sacred places but what again was pictured to them of old in type and shadow this now christ transforms into truth for god says to the hierophant moses and thou shalt set the mercy seat above upon the ark and in the ark thou shalt put the testimonies that i shall give thee and there will i be known to thee and i will commune with thee from above the mercy seat from between the two cherubim which are upon the ark of the testimony in respect of all things which i shall command thee unto the children of israel but our lord jesus christ when it was now the middle of the feast as it is written having entered as god into the holy places dedicated unto god there speaks to the multitudes although he went up in secret as therefore upon the mercy seat in the tabernacle god's descent was secret and then scarcely perceived when the time for his speaking was come and to one then also to the blessed moses did god talk speaking to none other so did christ too instruct the one race of the jews and converse with one people having not yet unfolded his grace as common to the gentiles and exceeding well does the blessed evangelist say not simply entered but went up into the temple for a high thing and very far surpassing our grovelling baseness was his entry into the divine school and sojourn in the holy places but the type of the act is true as to us for it was christ who sanctifieth the temple and of this moses of old was a type anointing the tabernacle with the hallowed oil and sanctifying it as it is written 
albeit it needed rather that man should be sanctified by the holy places than sanctify them but there is no account taken of things done in a type for the truth's sake for the sake of which the things in shadows were moulded as one may see in the holy prophets also for one was commanded against his will to go in unto an harlot another to walk naked yea also to lie upon his right side for many days these things were performed for the sake of their meanings and not surely for their own sakes thus then the blessed moses too was bidden to sanctify the tabernacle albeit he needed rather to receive sanctification from it that christ again may be understood in him sanctifying his own temple although he lived with flesh among the jews and in it spake to the multitude as did god of old from the mercy seat fifteen the jews therefore were marvelling saying how knoweth this man letters having not learned not unreasonable is the wonder of the jews but there is something subtle in their argument for it was likely that they would be astonished at seeing him strangely excel both in word and knowledge who could not have been rich from instruction for the mind of man is recipient of wisdom and even though one do not as yet seem wise yet is his nature exceedingly well adapted to the attainment of wisdom and knowledge on some subjects but in the case of those who were not well exercised in learning the natural advantage gets somehow stopped up and dulled in that of those who are accustomed to go through such toils and to revel in literary exercises it is very clear and apt for good practice and is found to have no mean store of letters and wise contrivances the jews then are astonished giving heed to the saviour christ not yet as being by nature god but still as a mere man and they marvel that he abounds in wisdom not having the provider hereof that is to say practice in reading for that he knows letters untaught this too then with the rest is a charge of jewish folly for it should have seemed nothing wonderful to them that wisdom the artificer of all things that is the only begotten word of god which was among them lying hid in the form of a man should not need letters this again must be observed for our prophet for above when they were seeking for jesus they say where is that man as though they knew him by his miracles alone not yet knowing accurately who or of whom or whence he was but here not as though ignorant of aught respecting him but as knowing all things clearly they say that he also knoweth letters not having learned the more obscure inquiry therefore respecting him of the common people and of those who had no accurate knowledge of him uttered where is that man contemptuously that of those who knew him the other more severe punishment then shall they undergo who were not ignorant than they who were for to the one their ignorance is an excuse to the other their knowledge condemnation therefore is it said that to some it is better not to have known the way of truth for in knowledge there is greater punishment because men are lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of god jesus then according to the difficulty of the jews knew letters having not learned moses was learned as it is written in all the wisdom of the egyptians yet as knowing nothing at all albeit exceeding wise among those was he instructed unto better knowledge by the oracles from god the wisdom of the world being convicted as feeble through the diviner and more excellent in which or through which we are instructed in the things of christ receiving the understanding which is truly from above and from god christ then is the in all things perfectly good the one of all things both wisdom and understanding in respect whereof he has the excellency not by teaching but innate and verily the prophet isaiah saith of him 
that before the child shall know good or evil he shall refuse evil and choose good and let us not foolishly suppose that the divine and heavenly offspring in discernment of reasonings or by the choice of the better turneth away from evil and applies itself rather to good but as if one should say of fire that it refuses cold its not admitting the being cold does not indicate choice of wills in it but rather most steady adherence of nature to what is its own so is it in respect of christ for all good things are in god of nature and are not introduced from without and so wisdom too was in him yea rather himself is properly and specially the fount of wisdom through which he gives wisdom in part to those in participation thereof both heavenly and earthly reasonable beings End of chapter five part two chapter five part three of commentary on the gospel of john book four by cyril of alexandria translated by rev philip edward pusey this librivox recording is in the public domain sixteen jesus answered them and said my doctrine is not mine but his that sent me we shall find that indeed true that is written by one of the wise men the spirit of the lord hath filled the world and the ear of hearing heareth all things but to those who of utter folly yea rather of blasphemy suppose that aught they utter will escape the divine mind the godlike psalmist says understand ye brutish among the people and ye fools when will ye be wise he that planted the ear heareth he not for how could it possibly happen that he should not surely hear all things who implanted the sense of hearing into them that were made by him see therefore in this too again that the lord is by nature god for the secret whispers of the jews in the crowd he is not ignorant of he receives them into his ears in god befitting way albeit from fear of the rulers they say nothing openly concerning him and when on one occasion certain of those who had rushed together into the temple marvelled and were reasoning as is like or gently saying one to another how knoweth this man letters not having learned needs does he again show himself equal to god the father who learneth nothing at all but hath the knowledge of all things by nature and without learning because he surpasseth all understanding and soareth above all wisdom that is in things that are it was then possible for him from other things too to show and to assure his hearers that whatsoever things are in the father these also are in him by reason of identity of nature which thing also he used to do in other things also from being able to do the same things and having like operation unto all things mounting up unto equal dignity for what things soever the father doeth these he saith doth the son too likewise and again for as the father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them so the son too quickeneth whom he will but here it was i suppose seasonable and most suitable to make a demonstration of the most necessary points for his discourse about wisdom and learning without letters was made with those who had been considering these things it behoved him then to show that this existed in him just as in the father what then is the mode of proof from his having equality of wisdom with him even though according to true and wise reasoning he most surely is himself wisdom and of god the father to whom in all things like he says he teaches the same things with him without any distinction for either on account of the exact likeness of his doctrine to that of the father does he say that it is the father's or because he is himself the wisdom of the father through which he speaketh and ordereth all things 
does he say that the doctrine too is his yet something else besides doth he dispense contributing not slightly to the salvation of his pupils for since they seeing a man on account of the flesh which was of earth receive not the word as being of god and therefore seem to be sick of a plausible unbelief profitably doth he attribute the teaching to god the father yet saying what was true and from fear of their being fighters against god if they held out any longer against the decrees from above persuading them to receive his words but we must know that by his saying again that he was sent he does not show that he is second in dignity to the father for we must not imagine a mission befitting a servant even though because clad in servant's form he might rightly say even this of himself but he was sent as word from mind as the sun's radiance from itself for these i suppose are processions from those things in which they are from their appearing to issue forth yet exist they naturally and immovably in those things whence they are for we ought not because word issues forth from mind and radiance from the sun therefore it ought to suppose that the things which produced are left of those which have gone forth of them but rather we shall see both those in these and these again existing in the former for mind will never be wordless nor yet word again without the mind fashioned therein analogously to this shall we conceive of the other also seventeen if any man do his will he shall know of the doctrine whether it be of god or whether i am speaking of myself we ought uncritically and without all doubt to receive the words of the truth and to believe that a thing once said cannot be otherwise than as it was declared to be but he permits not his saying to be without proof on account of the unbelievers but introduces a most evident and exceeding clear solution tempering with much skill the fashion of his words and what the skill is what the order of the economy we will again say they were seeking to kill him on account of the paralytic him i mean that was healed on the sabbath day gently then does he alike scare them from their dreadful purpose against him and clearly does he convict those who are travailing with their bloodthirsty purpose against him that they were choosing to fulfil their own lust rather than the will of the lawgiver for then saith he shall ye know perfectly of my doctrine that it is of god the father when ye shall choose to follow his will rather than your own but the will of the lawgiver and of god is to abstain wholly from murder then then he saith shall ye not holden beforehand by unjust hatred nor thrust forth in brutish guise to no seasonable anger know clearly whether the word of my teaching is of god or whether i am speaking of myself having therefore interwoven reproof with profit he with justice accuses them for that they unreasonably mock at what he teaches though god the father consenteth and co-willeth or what also is true co-teacheth and co-interpreteth but he puts of myself for privately and wholly severed from being after the co-will and purpose of the father and i do not suppose any person of sound mind will think that he accuses his own words of being spurious but says that they will never be otherwise than in accordance with the will of god the father for he speaks by his own word and wisdom his own offspring but that speaks not at all diversely from himself for how could it eighteen he that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory he giveth this evident proof that he doth not labour for his own glory by his teaching 
that he does not use any strange words and foreign to the law for this were to speak of himself but that he is exhorting them rather to be obedient to the former oracles while he removes only the unprofitable and gross shadow of the letter and transforms it persuasively into the spiritual sense which already lay hid in types what then he says in the gospel according unto matthew i came not to destroy the law but to fulfil this again he indirectly intimates here for the gospel polity hath but the transformation of the letter into the truth and having transfashioned the mosaic type unto what is more fitting hath the knowledge of the worship in spirit christ therefore speaketh and not of himself that is nothing diverse from the things already foretold for he does not put away moses nor doth he teach us to reject the instruction of the law but over what had been shadowed out in type as it were some brighter tint to overlay the truth very skilfully acquiring the good will of the jews does he offer the honour and glory to god the father for since the jews knowing not the word that had appeared from god the father were supposing that the law had been given by the father only with reason did he affirm that he was glorified by the keeping of the law and endured the contrary if it were not kept as it ought but even though the son is partaker of the glory of the father and through him had god the father spoken to moses yet he assents to their opinions economically but in that he speaks nothing of himself that does not agree with the law he confesses that not surely his own glory is it that he is zealous to build up but that due to the law besides this this too must be observed for indirectly and darkly he finds fault with the jews who are falling into those very things which they ignorantly blame and are accustomed to snatch at glory for themselves rather than god the lord of all and how i will tell for they falling away from the commandments of the law were born each to what liketh him teaching as it is written for doctrines the commandments of men for this again well does christ convict them as transgressors and as sinning against the very lawgiver in that they persuaded their hearers not to live after his ordinances but rather to give heed to their doctrines therefore albeit christ says still indefinitely and absolutely he that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory he is reproving the disease of the madness of the pharisees and that through their choosing to speak rather their own words they are stealing the glory of the lawgiver in transferring to themselves the things due to god they thence shall not at length to seek to kill him on which account specially convicts he them of transgressing excusing themselves duly under the pretence that they were zealous to keep the law and thereby honour god the father but he that seeketh saith he his glory that sent him this one is true and no unrighteousness is in him as he who doth not seek rather the honour of god but his own is not true but most exceedingly unjust for he is not true seeing he slandereth the law and bringeth in his own will in its place most unjust too in that he thrusteth aside the righteous judgment of the lawgiver and putteth his own above his lord's righteous then and true is christ obnoxious to none of the aforesaid charges nineteen hath not moses given you the law and no one of you keepeth the law why are ye seeking to kill me by many devices cometh about the discourse of the saviour to one aim for having in the preceding indirectly blamed as was meet the pharisees who supposed that they ought not to obey the commands from above but to introduce their own opinions and were zealous rather to gain honour from those under them and did not offer it to the lord of all but diverted it to their own persons that thence they were daring to transgress more freely 
he again in other and severest wise prepares for them open at length an unveiled reproof for he being condemned for breach of the sabbath and enduring the most unjust accusation of lawlessness for this convicted them not of individually transgressing the law but that the whole nation of the jews had made the law of moses of no account for tell me he saith ye who condemn the man who is zealous to show mercy on the sabbath day who have passed foulest censure upon those who do well and freely condemn the compassionate hath not the commandment not to murder been delivered you by moses whom ye admire did ye not hear him say the innocent and righteous slay thou not why then do ye grieve even your own moses by so readily transgressing the law that was appointed through him an argument and clear proof of this is that ye persecute me who have done no wrong and are unjustly eager to slay him who can never be accused of that whereby he should suffer this very pointed then is the saviour's discourse and most severely herein does he attack the mad folly of the jews and show that they who fall as it were with unbridled course unto condemning him for his transgression of the sabbath show themselves transgressors and choosers of murder and for this cause alone fall into the worst of all sins he all but cries aloud the paralytic who had fallen into a bitter and incurable complaint and who was spent with weakness at length intolerable i have healed on the sabbath day but for my well-doing i am condemned as though i had been taken in the worst of crimes and for this ye determined murder against me what manner of punishment then he says shall be devised for you commensurate with such monstrous deeds for lo yourselves too are transgressing the law but the mode of your transgressions is not of like nature with the charges against me for not as well-doers like me are ye persuaded to do this but with a view to murder which is worse than all transgression how then is moses with you in these things on whose account i though a preserver am condemned did not he appoint you the law concerning this do not ye again while trampling on my word ignore its transgression by devising murder unjustly such things then might christ well say to the ungodly pharisees but he abstracts the law for the present from his own person although he is himself the lawgiver and attributes it as it were to the father alone by him specially shaming into silence the shameless jews among whom he was considered greater than he for as we have often said they did not yet acknowledge that he is god by nature nor did they yet know the deep mystery of the economy with flesh but admired rather the glory of moses twenty twenty one the people answered thou hast a devil who is seeking to kill thee jesus answered and said unto them they feel the charges and hit by the bitter words thence proceeding they betake themselves to denial not actually repudiating the murderous design but only with all diligence putting from them the appearance of breaking the law the boast of the pharisees in appearance only therefore was christ wont to call them whited sepulchres also outwardly clad in the beauty of the ingenuity of art but within full of the uncleanness of the dead but i suppose that they say these things to take away fear as to his expecting to suffer anything not truly giving him an assurance that he will not suffer but drawing him forth unto a hazardous confidence and thinking to persuade him not to be zealous to be hid from them for then it would be no hard matter to plot against him at least as they supposed for they ignorantly deemed not knowing him that was persecuted that he would be obnoxious to their perverseness even though he willed not to suffer and would be caught 
like one of those who knew not the thought that lay hid in their minds. The fruit, then, of their stubbornness is their denial, and another kind of blasphemy against Christ. For by what things they endeavor to repel his words as untrue, they condemn him as a liar, adding iniquity to their iniquity, as it is written. One work I did, and do ye all marvel? We will read the verse as a question, with a comma, and a full stop but we will not be ignorant of the subtle meaning of the word replete with a most wise economy for observe how on relating to the jews his loving kindness to the impotent man he does not say unguardedly i have healed the man on the sabbath day and do ye therefore marvel but more cautiously and far more heedfully he says one work i did soothing the unseasonable anger of the multitude for it was not unlikely that they cut by the transgression against the sabbath would even now attempt to stone jesus for indiscreet of counsel according to the greek poets and prone to anger is ever the multitude both applying gentleness accord to whatsoever it is minded to and easily excited like a bull unto intolerable daring it is caught more apt than it ought in daring undertakings to dreadful ends. Having therefore put away all boast for their profit's sake, he makes use of the gentlest words, and with exceeding moderation, he says, One work I did, and do ye all marvel? On account of this one work, he says, although it was wrought for the salvation and life of the prostrate, do ye condemn the mighty worker thereof, as though for offences truly heinous, and looking only to the honour of the Sabbath, accord not wonder to the miracle? For this indeed would have been more fitting. But because the commandment of the law has been broken according to your foolish imagination, for no slight or worthless reasons, but for the salvation and life of a man, ye are unreasonably angry when ye ought rather to praise him who is clad with so great and god-befitting power untutored then by these things also are the people of the jews proved to be expending undue astonishment upon the man that was healed and not rather offering it to christ who miraculously preserveth but we must know that he in addressing them of israel and saying one work i did and do ye all marvel again indirectly reproves and makes known something of this kind for on account of this one according to you offence of mine he says ye marvel at my purpose as though i were bold to thrust aside the lawgiver then how deem ye that god feels towards you who not once merely offend against the law but make nothing of transgressing it in matters for which ye judge others. 22. Therefore hath Moses given you circumcision, not because it is of Moses, but of the fathers, and ye on the Sabbath day circumcise a man. Of deep meaning is the word, and hard to be reached the purpose of the text, but it will be manifest through the grace of him that illuminateth defeating then by many words the uninstructedness of the jews and manifoldly teaching them that they ought not to go off to unseasonable wrath on account of the breach of the sabbath by reason the son of man is lord of the sabbath day but having at length attained no good effect by reason of the ill counsel of the hearers he passes on to another mode of economy and endeavours to show clearly that the hierophant moses himself the minister of the law break the law of the sabbath on account of the circumcision which had extended from the custom of the fathers even unto his own times that he too might with reason be shown to be an observer of the custom of the fathers and since god works on the sabbath therefore he revealing himself too as a worker holds that it is in no wise a transgression of the sabbath by reason of his being ever like-minded with the father wherefore he also said 
my father worketh hitherto and i work in order then he saith that ye beholding me working on the sabbath day may not marvel as at some strange and most monstrous thing moses hath given you circumcision on the sabbath and he was beforehand in breaking the law respecting it and why he did not think he should be doing right in dishonouring the law given to the fathers and their custom on account of the sabbath day therefore a man is circumcised on the sabbath day too but if moses considered that he ought to honour the custom of the fathers and made that superior to the honour of the sabbath why are ye vainly troubled at me and marvel at me as though i were one of those wont heedlessly to transgress the law out of contempt for the law albeit he says i work equally with the father and ever agree with him in every purpose and since he works on the sabbath day well do i refuse to be idle thereon he says that moses gave them circumcision although it was not of him according to what has been just said but of the fathers because the ordinance of circumcision was given to the fathers but its rites were more definitely and clearly ordered by moses for our forefather abraham was circumcised but not on the eighth day nor was a pair of turtle-doves or two young pigeons offered for him in accordance with the rites of moses End of chapter five chapter six of commentary on the gospel of john book four by cyril of alexandria translated by rev philip edward pusey this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter six a dissertation upon the rest of the sabbath manifoldly showing of what it is significant twenty three if a man on the sabbath day receives circumcision that the law of moses should not be broken are ye angry at me because i made a whole man well on the sabbath day the verse is unintelligible to the many and not very clear as to its subdivisions we will therefore speak of that first we will therefore read it bit by bit changing the structure of the verse for thus you will clearly understand the meaning if then he says a man on the sabbath day receives circumcision are ye angry at me that the law of moses should not be broken because i made a whole man well on the sabbath day for a man does not receive circumcision on the sabbath day that the law of moses be not broken for it is broken when the sabbath is made void by circumcision for as we taught before yea rather as the saviour himself said circumcision is not of moses but of the fathers so that by reason of the circumcision from the fathers the law of moses is broken i mean that respecting the sabbath therefore we must connect the words that the law of moses should not be broken to our saviour's words for he says are ye angry at me that the law of moses should not be broken because i made a whole man well on the sabbath day the case of the subdivision then has been now herein settled we must go to the interpretation of the things signified too even though they are exceedingly hard to understand circumcision then he says is a way of taking care for a man and it surpasses the ordinance itself of the sabbath for it was of necessity that the suffering should be made whole what then is the hindrance or how will the ordinance of the sabbath reasonably stand in the way of healing the whole body since it permits already without blame its breach by a partial and slight healing for a man is circumcised and healed of the wound without blame on the sabbath day vainly then he says are ye indignant to the worker of the better things objecting the transgression of the law when the law is not grieved at being put aside by moses for a petty circumcision by these things is enwoven an argument persuading them to agree that they ought not vainly to be annoyed 
since Moses had already been a type thereof, whom they foolishly thought they ought to take the part of, and making no account of his law, were being hurried off to the duty of committing murder. 24. Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. The law, he says, which ye are so zealous to take the part of, and for the sake of which ye were kindled even unto fierce wrath, openly cries aloud, Ye shall not respect persons in judgment, for the judgment is God's. Ye then who condemn me as a transgressor on account of the Sabbath, and decide that it is most fitting to be angry at this, do ye care for the honor of the law, take shame at the message, judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. For if ye put Moses forth from transgression, and rightly consider that he has no portion of condemnation for this, albeit he breaketh the ordinance of the Sabbath on account of circumcision, which is of the fathers, do ye free from blame the son too, who ever agreeeth with the mind of the father, and approveth his will, and whatsoever things he doeth, these likewise is he too wont to do. But if ye condemn the son only, and do not condemn Moses, although he is involved, he saith, in equal blame to that wherein ye suppose that I too am involved on account of the Sabbath, how will ye not be found to be trampling on the divine law, and be taken insulting the decrees from above, out of respect to some corrupting the command to judge righteousness, and rendering superior to the divine commands him to whom ye transgressing pay reverence from respect of persons. Let the wise hearer observe again the wondrous skill of our Saviour Christ. When accused of the breach of one law, he convicts them as transgressors by very many arguments, all but uttering the gospel words. And why lookest thou at the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? An evil thing, then, is it to condemn others. For wherein a man judges another, he condemneth himself, as it is written. Wherefore by the Saviour to himself was it said, Judge not, and ye shall not be judged. Condemn not, and ye shall not be condemned and this we say in respect of ourselves. For Christ will never become a transgressor by changing his own laws to whatsoever he will, and overlaying with the fair beauty of truth the shadows of the law. That at length the things enjoined in a more carnal sense to them of old may be changed into a spiritual interpretation. But since our discourse, which was upon the mention of the Sabbath, hath flowed into that of circumcision, I think that not less profit than is due will accrue to the true searcher after wisdom, through his clearly beholding what the seventh-day rest means, what again is signified by the circumcision on the eighth day, and by his learning in addition why circumcision is received on the Sabbath itself not enduring to keep the legal rest. Rightly examining each point as well as I can, I will endeavor to make it clear. The first consideration will be that of the seventh day, or Sabbath, and its rest. For so will the inquiry into what follows be most convenient. Therefore let us inquire into the first appointed law on this subject, how and in what manner it arose. For when God brought Israel out of the bondage in Egypt unto their original and ancient freedom by the hand of the all-wise Moses, and having miraculously brought them through the midst of the sea, with foot somehow dry and unwetted, commanded them to hasten on unto the land of promise, at length accustoming them of necessity to purify themselves beforehand and cleanse themselves he called them to an assembly in Mount Sinai. And having descended upon it in the likeness of fire, he gave them decrees unto salvation, saying, 
I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods but me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any image, or any likeness that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not worship them, nor serve them. For I am the Lord thy God, a jealous God. For it was fitting, it was fitting thence to commence the ordinance of what was profitable, in first to foreinitiate with the doctrines of divine knowledge, them who had once given themselves to the service and obedience of God. For knowledge of God is the root of all virtue, and the foundation of piety is faith. Having therefore revealed himself, and as it were made himself manifest by saying, I am the Lord thy God, and having first wrought in them faith by knowledge, and having wholly interdicted the making of an image and the worship of falsely called gods, he shows that their transgression will not be unpunished, and sets before them the punishment of turning aside, crying, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, that is, Thou shalt not put about a vain idol the divine and most dread name. For the Lord, he says, will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Having then said that he shall be guilty of no slight transgression, who shall please to worship another, and to enroll himself under a false god, and having threatened them accordingly, as people newly brought to the faith, and having a feebler understanding, he adds in order, and as it were establishes a second law, saying, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work then profitably showing whom they will imitate in so doing he says for in six days the lord made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them and rested the seventh day wherefore the lord blessed the seventh day and hallowed it what then will a man say did the ordinance of the sabbath purport or why after the threatening against transgressions was a second and similar law straightway introduced to this we say that it was right not only to threaten transgressors that they should undergo dreadful sufferings nor by fear alone to establish israel unto piety for the service of fear is of a more slavish sort but to show of what they will be partakers and to what end they will come who are firmly fixed in love to him he defines therefore and gives them as in a type the promise of the future good things for the law hath a shadow of the good things to come as it is written and its form is shown to be an exercise preparatory to the truth for he commands them to rest on the last day of the week, that is, the Sabbath, and to cease from all work, and give it over, and to practice rest thereon, signifying thereby the rest and enjoyment that should be to the saints at the completion of ages, when they, having ended their life in the world, and having cleansed away the sweat of their good works, they who are in Christ, shall live the life without toil and free from all weariness according to that which is spoken concerning them by the mouth of the prophet for they shall forget their former tribulation and it shall not come into their heart but everlasting joy shall be upon their head for upon their head praise and joy shall take hold on them sorrow and grief and sighing are fled away they too imitating the creator who ceased and all but rested from the toils of creation will cease from their labours in this life attaining unto the delight to be given by christ at the end of the ages and to this end i think that the appointed rest on the sabbath tends but 
Note how the lawgiver says negatively, Thou shalt not worship any other gods. But on giving the kindred commandment about the Sabbath which follows it, he says, Remember. And why? Because the time for not worshipping other gods was now gone by, for therefore he immediately commanded them to be diligent about this. But by means of memory it was possible to behold things to come, and to see aforehand in thought what was already limbed in types. We must moreover notice this too. For when he had well enforced our position with regard to our faith, he straightway adds the memorial of the promise at the end of ages, and then ordains the remaining laws. Honor thy father and thy mother, thou shalt not kill, and so on. That we may not think we are justified by works, nor look for the ungrudged bounteousness of God as the fruit of our own toils, but that we shall have it of faith. Therefore, before the laws of godly conversation, grace hath straightway entered in as the next neighbor to our faith of the good things in hope. The Sabbath rest, then, signifies the life of the saints in rest and holiness, when they, having at length put off all that is troublous, and ceased from every toil, shall delight in the good things from God and verily the blessed paul when he discoursed to us of these things and most excellently essayed to inquire into the mode of the rest of the people saith thus and to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest but to them that believed not and we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief for since certain were supposing that that was the land of rest wherein they came that came forth out of Egypt, albeit that is taken as a type of the one which shall be given to the saints by Christ, which David called the land of the living, the most wise Paul endeavors to show, that that which was then given for an inheritance to the children of Israel by the command of Joshua was a type of that which is looked for, for that these things are taken as a type of the truth he diligently proves, bringing an argument demonstrative of what has been said. For he saith thus, Seeing therefore it remaineth that some enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached enter not in because of unbelief, he again limiteth a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time, as it is foresaid to-day if ye will hear his voice harden not your hearts as in the provocation for if jesus had given them rest then would he not afterward have spoken of another day seest thou how diligently he overthrew the apparent objection for one striving with jewish arguments might straightway have said what then art thou saying most excellent sir hath not joshua brought the people into the land of promise did they not rest and keep sabbath in it yea he saith but in type and imitation of the true for if in these things only the grace of god and the measure of his promise is marked out and in them have been fulfilled to israel their hopes and the letter of the law signifies nothing else besides how as though joshua had not given them rest is again another period of rest marked out by the blessed david although he was so long after wisely then and very skilfully does he after having shown that the historical incidents are a type and image of spiritual things reveal the still concealed and hidden interpretation of the sabbath adding there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of god for he that is entered into his rest he also hath ceased from his own works as god did from his how then will it not be hence at length clearly confessed that the mind of the saints knows that the resting from toils that is to say those of our labours is the sabbath-keeping when the bright band of the saints shall delight in their good deeds before wrought in this life, after the likeness of the Creator of all things, 
who rested and rejoiced on the seventh day as wisdom saith in the book of proverbs i was she in whom he delighted daily rejoiced i before him at every time when he was rejoicing on having completed the earth and was rejoicing in the sons of men therefore for i will return again to the original subject and will recapitulate the bent of the whole discourse the rest of the sabbath denotes the toilless life of the saints for without toil shall all good things be given at that time to the saints by god nor shall we then work sin the foundation of ills because it shall perish root and branch from us together with him who was wont to sow it in us according as it is said no lion shall be there nor shall aught of evil beasts go up thereon but a pure way shall be there and it shall be called an holy way yea and the mind of the saints will retain all good things without toil therefore he too who gathered sticks on the sabbath day died by stoning as having wronged the truth in the type for after having ceased and arrived at that rest we shall never go forth of that habit both admirable and illustrious in virtues as they did from their tent nor shall we any more collect sin which is the food and mother of fire as did that man the wood through his exceeding senselessness not understanding the types which point to the truth therefore also with senseless stones as himself taken in much senselessness was he stoned by the avengers having the character of his manners inscribed in his punishment that we shall not then commit any abominable sin is therefore manifest nor yet shall we by sweat attain what is profitable and this again we shall see shown as it were darkly in the books of moses for god showered down the manna like dew upon the sons of israel in the wilderness and gave them angels bread as it is written and then he appointed a law too respecting it by the all-wise moses for thus did he make proclamation eat to-day for to-day is a sabbath unto the lord ye shall not find it in the field six days ye shall gather but on the seventh day which is the sabbath in it there shall be none for he hints that before the completion of the ages it is convenient that we collect with toil that which profiteth and nourisheth us unto everlasting life as they traversing the wide wilderness gather together from all quarters manna for their food but on the seventh that is in the final end the time for collecting what is profitable is gone by and we shall delight ourselves in the things already provided according as it is said by the psalmist thou shalt eat the fruit of thy toils god the lawgiver then not taking pleasure in the shadows but looking beforehand to the very image of the things issued proclamation that we ought not to labor on the sabbath but certain men having despised the law given them about this and not shrinking from foolhardily offending the lord of all determined that they ought to go out to gather men even on the sabbath and not in counsels only was their daring endeavor but in very deed they accomplished what seemed them good the lawgiver therefore for this again finds fault with them and says how long choose ye not to keep my commandments and my law see for that the lord gave you this day for a sabbath therefore he hath given you on the sixth day the bread of two days abide ye every man in his place let no man go out of his place on the seventh day seest thou how he forming beforehand for us life free from all sweat and toil in the typical rest enjoins them to do nothing at all on the sabbath for he does not permit them to gather and enjoins them besides not to leave their house and to go any whither nor to go forth from their own place and what again he wills us to learn by this we will set forth 
bringing forward a kindred in similar command the blessed prophet jeremiah spake then to the jews on this wise thus saith the lord keep your souls and bear no burden on the sabbath day and go not forth of the gates of jerusalem neither carry forth burdens out of your houses on the sabbath day neither do ye any work hallow the sabbath day as i commanded your fathers and what thence urging as aforesaid to a watchful habit he bids us keep our own soul for thus will our duty of hastening unto the hoped-for sabbath-keeping be easily accomplished but how many good things shall be revealed to those who possess this he beautifully makes known by the introduction of the other things for he does not suffer any to be laden with a burden since no one at that time will take up the heavy burden of sin for it is the time of holiness when our old sin having departed to utter destruction the soul of each is renewed to a habit of virtue unwavering yea and he does not suffer them to go forth of the gates of jerusalem for according to the true and orthodox doctrine the glorious choir of the saints shall dwell securely in the heavenly jerusalem and shall not go forth of the holy city but rather shall be therein for ever held fast by the divine power so as never to be able to run away from the good things once for all given them for the gifts and calling of god are without repentance according to st paul but in saying again ye shall not go forth every man from his place he seems to imply this most clearly for many in truth are the mansions with god the father according to the saviour's word and of this was the holy tabernacle in all glory fulfilling the type which had ten chambers and to each shall be given according to his deserts and proportionally to his good deeds his abode but they that are holy in possession of their tabernacles there they shall dwell there for ever and will never come to fall from the things allotted to them by the divine free gift and a true witness hereof shall be introduced by us for the prophet isaiah having clearly stated these things speaketh thus thine eyes shall see jerusalem a wealthy city tabernacles that shall not be shaken nor shall be removed for ever for in saying that the tabernacles in the wealthy city shall not be shaken he shows the immutability of the abode and habitation therein yea he says moreover and neither do ye any work thereon but hallow ye the sabbath day as we have already often said the time of rest and refreshment belongs to both and it is wholly kept holy as a feast to christ again that we ought to do no work on the sabbath day but to rest as it were and cease from everything that inviteth to sweat and toil we shall know from other sources also for he says in exodus six years thou shalt sow thy land and shalt gather in the fruits thereof but the seventh year thou shalt let it rest and lie still and in leviticus when ye come into the land which i give you the land which i give you shall keep a sabbath unto the lord six years thou shalt sow thy field and six years thou shalt prune thy vineyard and gather in the fruit thereof but in the seventh year shall be a rest unto the land a sabbath to the lord for it is not the land which is insensible to toil that he releases nor yet to it doth he in reality give this law but he brought it about to those who possessed it that they should not toil through his giving a release to the land for in many ways did he point out our feast in christ in which they who have lived in the divine fear shall hasten unto the perfect and complete liberty which is in holiness and to the most wealthy grace of the spirit and this again we shall know from the mosaic commands themselves for it runs thus 
when thy brother an hebrew man or an hebrew woman is sold unto thee six years shall he serve thee in the seventh year a release for we who were of old slaves to sin and by taking pleasure in evil had in some sort sold ourselves to the devil being justified in christ through faith shall mount up to the true and holy sabbath-keeping clothed with the liberty which is through grace and glorified with the good things from god End of chapter 6chapter seven of commentary on the gospel of john book four by cyril of alexandria translated by rev philip edward pusey this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven a dissertation upon the circumcision on the eighth day manifoldly showing of what it is significant having now sufficiently as i think and according to the power of my understanding unfolded the purpose of the sabbath we will transfer the labour of investigation to circumcision which is akin thereto resolving from all quarters to hunt out as befits what is of use for it were most absurd and not free from the extremest ridicule that one should not gladly give all toil in exchange for the knowledge of these things what then was by it also typically expressed to them of old we considering the subject spiritually will set forth according to the measure of the gift of the god of all who maketh dark things manifest and openeth to us hidden and invisible treasures for they who have already attained and do have it undefective and have their understanding maturer may both conceive and utter things far superior to these but we will set before our readers what comes into our mind though it seem to come far short of what is fitting not sinning against brotherly love by fear of seeming inferior to any but rather knowing the scripture give occasion to a wise man and he will be yet wiser teach a just man and he will receive yet more the first law then respecting circumcision was ordained when god said to abraham thou shalt keep my covenant in thy seed after thee in their generations and this is my covenant which i will covenant between you and me and thy seed after thee in their generations every man-child among you shall be circumcised and ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man-child. But when he had appointed the law as to this, and had decreed that they should surely circumcise the flesh of their foreskin, he shows that the transgression of the law will not be without harm, showing that it is the type of a most essential mystery for he subjoins as follows and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant and the uncircumcised man-child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised on the eighth day that soul shall be cut off from his seed he hath scattered my covenant the divine paul then affirmed that circumcision had been given to the patriarch as a sign and a seal of the faith which he had in uncircumcision for it was his aim it seems and zealous endeavour to show that the calling and righteousness which are through faith surpass and are elder than every command of the law for thus hardly did he shame them of Israel, and persuade them not to esteem the righteousness of faith a transgression of the law, but rather a return to that which was from the beginning and before all law. Yet is he, seasonably bringing round the force of his subject to what is immediately profitable and of use for the present time, found to know of another kind of circumcision for wishing to unteach the jews their delight in glorying in the flesh he writes again for not he is a jew which is one outwardly neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh 
but he is a jew which is one inwardly and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter whose praise is not of men but of god does he not hereby persuade them to change at length to other thoughts respecting this and would not have them look on circumcision as merely the gift of the seal to our forefather of the faith which he had being yet uncircumcised but conceive of it as something greater and spiritual we must then investigate and examine not remissly what the circumcision in the spirit is of what that which is accomplished in the flesh is a symbol and why not on any day indifferently as it might happen but only on the eighth man is circumcised it is then obvious to every man that since our aim is intent to be united to god through christ the mediator therefore it surely befits those who mount up by faith to intimate nearness with the all holy lord to first purify and sanctify themselves in every way we will take as a most excellent image of this kind of thing that which was spoken by god to the holy moses go down protest unto the people and sanctify them to-day and to-morrow and let them wash their clothes and be ready against the third day for the third day the lord will come down upon the mount sinai in that they were to sanctify themselves beforehand he would have them attend to fitness of habits in that they were to wash their clothes he points to purity of the body itself for the body is as it were the garment and array of the soul since then for i will go up to the first and most necessary beginning of the subject they who are hastening to an intimate nearness to the holy god must surely first purify themselves according to what is said by him holy shall ye be for i am holy he ordained a symbol of sanctification to them of old through the circumcision in the flesh and how we will say on examining into the nature of things among us we shall find pleasure taking the lead of all sin and some hot lust ever proceeding in its working invites us to transgression and first taking captive the prudence of the understanding thus at length persuades us to come by a most smooth way under the attainment of the things desired and the disciple of christ shows that what we have said on these matters is true for thus proclaims he let no man say when he is tempted i am tempted of god for god cannot be tempted with evil neither tempteth he any man but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed then lust when it hath conceived bringeth forth sin and sin when it is finished bringeth forth death seest thou then how in lust toward anything the birth of evil is first formed and the seed of sin is first conceived in forbidden pleasure god the lawgiver then commands the circumcising steel to be applied to that part of the body wherein and whence is the birth of pleasures that thou mayest learn as it were darkly that it is impossible for us ever to appear pure unless by receiving the most sharp working of the divine word in our heart and admitting into our mind the sword of the spirit we drive away lust after all the basest things never doing after our own wills even though they pretend to have the sweetest enjoyment but persuaded only to love and do the will of god seeing that the truer circumcision brings unto us such power well may it be said to those who are accustomed to glory in the flesh only circumcise yourselves to god and circumcise the hardness of your heart men of judah and inhabitants of jerusalem for he that is circumcised in the flesh is circumcised to the flesh only but he that hath received the circumcision in the spirit through faith to christward is circumcised to god only and truly but we receive the circumcision in the spirit which bringeth us up to an intimate nearness to god 
on the eighth day, that is, the day of the resurrection of the Saviour, taking this as a sign that the circumcision of the Spirit is the giver of life, and agreeing in some sort through the thing itself, that we shall live with Christ, according to what is said by Paul, for ye died, and your life hath been hidden with Christ in God. When Christ shall appear, your life, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. For will not one say, and that with truth, that one dies to the world by refusing the world's pleasures for God's sake? Such an one did the divine Paul to manifest himself to us, saying, god forbid that i should glory save in the cross of christ by whom the world hath been crucified unto me and i unto the world for it made partakers of him through the spirit which circumciseth without hands all the impurity that is in us we become dead to the world and live a most excellent life to god therefore circumcision is on the eighth day by reason of the resurrection of christ and not before the eighth for not before the resurrection was the gift of the spirit but after it or at the very time of the resurrection when he breathed on his disciples also saying receive ye the holy ghost to the jews then the circumcision by the knife was more fitting for they were yet slaves and under the avenging law and the iron is the symbol of punishment but to us as free and spiritual belongs the purification through the spirit banishing all pollution from our souls and bringing in perfection in the brightness of godliness through faith for that through the truer and spiritual circumcision is accomplished the boast of perfection in godliness we shall perceive by considering what is written respecting the patriarch abraham it is written then of our forefather abraham that his years were ninety and nine in number and then did god serviceably ordain him circumcision making this too as it were an evident sign that circumcision is as it were a vestibule and approach to perfection in virtue or rather clearly signifying that no one will ever arrive at this who has not the purification which is shadowed forth by circumcision for the number one hundred is the symbol of perfection circumcision then precedes perfection for it when it precedes easily brings us to that but not to these things are limited the benefits of circumcision i mean of circumcision in the spirit but we shall find that it too belongs to those only who are free in christ but wholly free i think in christ is the man who hath shaken off the bondage of the devil and the yoke of sin and hath broken asunder their bonds as it is written and hath bound upon him the glorious and untyrannical boast of righteousness i mean the righteousness which is in faith of christ but that we shall find circumcision on the eighth day befitting the free but by no means those who are slaves we on traversing the holy and divine scripture shall in no wise doubt ishmael then the son born to the patriarch of the handmaid hagar was circumcised but not on the eighth day but rather in his thirteenth year for so it is written that abraham circumcised ishmael his son at thirteen years old in order that the divine word may show us that the son of jerusalem which is in bondage that is israel hath fallen both from the eighth and from the twelfth for it falleth from the eighth as not choosing to receive the saving preaching of the resurrection which took place on the eighth day that is the gospel of christ whereby there is no doubt that we aided unto faith are circumcised in spirit but it falleth again from the twelfth too as it were in figure thrusting away by their unbelief the holy choir of the apostles and desiring to abide entirely without taste and experience of their doctrine herein then is the servant 
but Isaac, the free son of the free, is circumcised on the eighth day. For the free children of the free, I mean Jerusalem which is above, are enriched receiving the eighth, that is, the resurrection of Christ, and the circumcision in spirit which freeth them from all sin, and releaseth them from death, because from sin too, whence and on account whereof is death, and transbringeth them unto the life of Christ. But that in addition to what we have already said, both undoing of death and the overthrow of corruption, are found through the circumcision in the spirit, we shall easily see by studying the book called Exodus. For the blessed Moses was sent by divine command to Pharaoh, the tyrant of the Egyptians, to tell him that it behoved him to let Israel go from that great bondage. And indeed he was setting out to meet with those things we spoke of. But it came to pass, it says, by the way in the inn, that the angel met him and sought to kill him. And Zipporah took a sharp stone and circumcised the foreskin of her son, and said, The blood of the circumcision of my son hath stayed, and he departed from him, because she said, The blood of the circumcision of my son hath stayed. Here, listen to me carefully. The so-called angel seeks to lay hands upon and to slay Moses, but hardly withdraws from him into parts, shamed by the circumcision of the child, which Sopora, performing with a stone, says that she has accomplished what is necessary. For scaring away the destroyer of Moses, she cries out, The blood of the circumcision of my son hath stayed. But unless some mystical meaning were hidden in these words, what mind, tell me, would be assured that the hierophant Moses was saved by the circumcision of his son, and that the destroyer making an onset like a wild beast desisted from his onslaught at the appearance of blood, and drew back and turned away? Then, for I will come to this point first, the benefit or glory of his own circumcision did not suffice the blessed Moses unto salvation. For I think I ought rather to speak thus. The might of the circumcision which is after the law will not overthrow death which cometh indifferently to every one, evil and good. But the circumcision in the spirit of the new people, that is, of those who have believed in Christ, most excellently performed by Sipora, that is, the church, both scares it against its will, and puts it to flight when raging. How, then, may some one with great reason say, is Israel too preserved in the spiritual circumcision of the new people, though he hath no share of it? To this we say, that as far as concerns Israel's not choosing to receive the resurrection of our Saviour Christ, death would have reigned even for ever. But since they which believed received it, the grace of the resurrection on their accounts passed into the whole nature, extended in some sort to the whole through the circumcision in the spirit even though a considerable difference of resurrection be seen in the one and the other. For they who thrust from them belief in Christ, and by their unbelief insult the giver of life, will gain power from the resurrection merely to live again. For they will live again unto doom, not having loved Christ who justifieth. But they who are admirers of the resurrection of the Saviour, and true keepers of the commandments, shall go forth of that land wherein they are, unto the resurrection of life, as it is written. The people then which is circumcised in spirit will transmit his own good even unto the unbelieving. For his of right is the grace of the resurrection, but he will transmit it unto the rest also. God desiring of his skill to preserve the whole nature. For as Paul saith, as we in times past disbelieved the mercy of Israel, that through their obedience we may gain the grace through Christ, 
so they too have now disbelieved our mercy that they too again may obtain mercy our saviour christ transmitting to them also through our faith the benefit of the resurrection for the things which are due to them that believe are more suitably given to the whole nature therefore the divine apostle paul also revealing to us the mystery concerning the resurrection that shall be says that christ will rise the first fruits for verily he also was first raised from the dead but afterwards he says that they are christ at his coming for he says that they who were intimately connected with him by faith must be raised before all the rest showing that the resurrection is strictly and properly due to them above all even though it have reached the whole nature god being pleased of his goodness that is and loving kindness wholly to abolish death but observe how not with iron does Zipporah circumcise the child for the iron is an avenger and beseems that are under the law which punisheth but with a stone as it is written understood as a type of christ for the indestructibility and stability in all respects of the nature of the only begotten is hereby signified wherefore god the father and the holy prophets called christ an adamant too saying behold i am setting an adamant in the midst of my people israel the adamant signified to us as in a figure that the divine and ineffable nature of the word can never yield to those which oppose it thus the divine joshua too after moses leadership and death being called to the command purified the children of israel with a divinely appointed stone and since he was to withstand the hand of the enemy right well was he commanded to arm them first in some sort by circumcision knowing that no otherwise would they who were on the very verge of fighting be above falling and superior to death and thus it is written concerning him and the lord said unto joshua make thee knives of rock of the sharp rock and sit down circumcise the children of israel and joshua made him knives of flints and circumcised the children of israel for herein the name rock signifies to us as it were the fixed and indestructible word of god the expression sharp points out the power of subtlety penetrating into things and its keenest energy since paul too who was nourished up in the holy and divine writings calls the divine word quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword and says that it pierces even to the parting of soul and spirit but the word so subtle and piercing entering our hearts through his own spirit frees them from all uncleanness and circumcising in an expressible manner the things in respect whereof we are full of the deepest abominations it renders us both holy and undefiled for see herein most translucent the image of the truth for jesus is he who circumciseth and they who undergo it of him are every fresh young child as it is written who this day knoweth not good or evil for they who came forth out of egypt had the divine wrath as the wages of their unbelief and manifold punishment overtook them in the desert it having been with reason determined by the all-holy god that he would not bring them into the land which he sware to their fathers but they who came after them being free from the charges of unbelief fulfilled the type of the new people so as even to receive the circumcision in the spirit through christ the old and first people that is israel having gone to perdition as we have just said nevertheless the noble and new people are circumcised under the command of joshua the other side jordan as it is written for the considerations that spring from the truth are thus we shall never receive the circumcision through the spirit in the heart 
as long as we have not yet been brought over the mystic jordan but are still on yon side of the holy waters but when all the people were circumcised by command of joshua straightway the lawgiver makes known the utility of the thing and says to the holy joshua this day have i rolled away the reproach of egypt from off you wherein then shall we grant that israel received benefit from circumcision or what reproach do we say was rolled away their bondage their exposure from weakness to be tyrannized over and yet more their hard labours in clay and brick seest thou from how great evils the might of the circumcision in spirit delivers for it delivers the soul of man out of the hand of the devil renders it free and let go from the sin which tyrannizes in us and maketh it superior to all the arrogance of wicked devils yea it frees from both clay and brick for no longer does it suffer one denied with the pleasures of the flesh nor that he be intermingled with the toils of earth but frees both from death and corruption nor are these all the benefits which arise from circumcision but it also renders us partakers of the divine nature through the participation of our saviour christ for the compiler of the book adds to what has been said and the children of israel kept the passover on the fourteenth day of the month and did eat of the corn of the land bread unleavened and new for no otherwise may one partake of the very lamb that taketh away the sin of the world nor yet find the unleavened and new food of the gospel preachings unless one have first passed the mystic jordan received the circumcision from the living word and rubbed off after some sort as it were a spot on the soul the reproach of egypt in the manner we have just expounded for that god loatheth as fall of reproach and all uncleanness him that is not yet circumcised not as holding in abomination the flesh which he disdained not to create but as hating him that is yet so to say in full vigour and complete as respects pleasures in evil by reason of his having lost nothing we shall know when we find him saying to holy moses and aaron this is the ordinance of the passover there shall no stranger eat thereof but every man's servant that is bought for money thou shalt circumcise him and then shall he eat thereof for he wholly excludes the stranger thereby signifying him who is not yet joined to christ through faith but him that is in bondage to sin and is in some sort sold to the devil he very seasonably commands to be first circumcised and purified and then to taste the most holy flesh for we being pure purely shall we partake of christ according to that which is orderly proclaimed in our churches holy things to the holy for in truth it were just and meet since our saviour christ died for us and cleansed us not with the purifications of the law but with his own blood that we too should offer to him our own life and as a just debt pay that we live no more to ourselves but repay as it were the complete consecration unto holiness of our own souls for that the precious blood and death of christ who died for all both saved us from all evil and was the giver of the spiritual circumcision whereby we gain that we are joined to god who is over all in this too shall we see for thus it is written in respect of him who was captain after moses i mean joshua the son of nun and it came to pass after these things that joshua the son of nun the servant of the lord died being an hundred and ten years old and they buried him in the border of his inheritance there they buried with him in the sepulchre wherein they buried him 
the knives of flints wherewith he circumcised the children of Israel. For the blessed Joshua died and was buried, and profitably were the knives affixed to the sepulchre, which ministered to the type of circumcision, that we again might understand by this, that the grace of circumcision in spirit, the wooer for us of all heavenly goods, is bound up in the death of our Saviour Christ. We will then understand that the circumcision on the eighth day, taking it in no Jewish sense, is the purification through the Spirit, in faith and the resurrection of Christ, the casting away of all sin, the destruction of death and corruption, the bestower of holiness and ownness with Christ, the image of freedom, the way and door to close friendship with God. Abundance, then, of spiritual considerations, then having been now contributed by us from all parts to these things, and the two chapters divided as was meet, and we having concluded for each the discussion suiting it, it remains and is due to say why the spiritual circumcision prevails over even the honor of the Sabbath. For circumcision is to be received even on the Sabbath day, unheeding the law of not working thereon. Since then the rest on the seventh day signifies freedom and rest from all wickedness and cessation from sin, and circumcision in spirit means nothing different from these, as it were in another way, for I think that the being freed from superfluous lust and overmuch pleasure clearly results in rest from evil we shall find not only that circumcision in no way breaks the law respecting the sabbath but even aids it and all but coincides in one and the same language with it openly proclaiming that one ought to rest and to desist from evil so that they both are the same i mean both circumcision and the rest of the sabbath as one will most rightly deem according to the concurrence of both in one aim for we will not adhere to the gross type of the history, but will rather spiritually go to the oracles of the Spirit. Unblameably, therefore, will the prophet of circumcision on the Sabbath too be brought in, since, as the Saviour saith, the priest in the temple profaned the Sabbath, by ministering thereon and not ceasing from their ordinary occupations, and are blameless as the judge himself hath testified to them with greatest reason. For what time is there wherein we ought to desist from works of holiness, in those wherein the deity delighteth? At what time is it not hurtful to slacken zeal and piety? The rest, then, on the Sabbath day hath a most praiseworthy ceasing, and staying from wickedness only and from abominable sin, but by no means hinders us from taking pleasure in holy deeds, and whatsoever any one supposes will be of profit to his own soul. This, too, it enjoins him, unblamed, to take all pains rightly to perform. This same profitableness you may see introduced also in the force of circumcision. For in cutting away pleasure in the direction of evil is perceived a birth of resting from sin, and a beginning of worship in spirit and most holy conversation. And the difference between them is slight, nevertheless a needful one. For in that he does not command both to be observed on the seventh day, nor yet on the eighth, the plan of each gives us to understand that there is a distinction, and this too has a meaning, and no inelegant one, as seems to me. For resting from wickedness is not yet the utter casting off also of wickedness. For oft times our passions are quiet within us, yet are not wholly cast out of our mind, but are, by sober reasoning, as it were, with a bridle, forcibly brought to the rest which is uncongenial to them, yea, and give way, even against their will, to the toils of discipline also but shaking off one's passion as far as a man can do is i suppose a wholly different thing and far greater than resting from passion 
having thus arranged our arguments on these matters we must finally consider that we shall not attain under the casting away of our passions or stumblings arising from pleasure which is the meaning of circumcision unless we first cease from sin which goes forth into action and hold as it were in rest the motions of our mind which run unto transgression for by using some step of this kind we shall easily attain what is yet greater and higher i mean the total casting off of our passions but the rest from passion seems to lie in some degree in our own power for we shall cease from evil by giving the force of our wills to what is better but to be released from our passions is surely not in our own power but is verily the fitting work of christ who suffered for us that he might remodel all to newness of life therefore meetly did circumcision obtain the eighth day introducing the renewing so to say time of the resurrection while the rest had the seventh day its neighbour and a little behind for rest for a season and at will falls and comes a little short of the entire cutting off of the passions end of chapter seven end of commentary on the gospel of john book four by cyril of alexandria translated by rev philip edward pusey